Come with me, friends, on a magical journey to the distant past of 2012, the year of the Markiplier, of Borderlands 2, that whole fiasco with the Mass Effects, and something else I'm forgetting, it probably wasn't that important. And of course, XCOM Enemy Unknown. What a ride it has been since that day, huh? Ever since Enemy Within, the series has gone on to spawn a very successful, much more high-profile sequel in 2016, an expansion to that sequel in 2018, and a side game XCOM Chimera Squad last year. And with XCOM 2 itself having been ported onto literally every device in the universe, I think it's safe to say that 2K is looking to keep this series going for a while. For those who already know me, and for those who don't, hi, nice to meet you. You're probably aware that XCOM 2 itself is a pretty big part of my channel's history. In fact, it's arguably one of the biggest reasons I'm doing content creation as a job at all. And after so many years since its release, I've gotten to thinking on what I'd like to see in any future major installments, as well as my biggest issues that I think need to be fixed as we go forward. I should preface this by saying that I've put a few hours into the game since its release, so I at least know a bit of what I'm talking about, at least I hope I do by now, and I'll mostly be focusing on what I think needs to be learned from XCOM 2's most recent versions, with all its DLC and War of the Chosen and such, since judging from Chimera Squad, it looks like Firaxis is going to be using that as a foundation for the rest of the series, but I've got at least a few comparisons to make to Enemy Unknown. And finally, everything you see in this video is going to be my opinions and nothing but. So if you've got suggestions and ideas for the future of the series, then feel free to comment them down below, since more comments means more engagement, and therefore maybe Algorithm Senpai will finally notice me. Oh, also, I'll not be talking about the original games. I haven't played those yet, so sorry. But with that all said, let's begin. So I got three words for you. Random number generation. You know it, you love it, you also hate it, and XCOM is infamous for it. To say the series has a bit of a reputation surrounding its percentage system is an understatement, considering that conversations within the gaming sphere about any game with goofy RNG almost always goes back to XCOM in some fashion. Because everyone's got their own horror stories. Let me tell you, nothing is going to put the fear of God into a seasoned XCOM veteran quite like seeing the numbers 80 through 99. But for some people, in fact quite a lot of newbies to the XCOM series, this system goes beyond being an occasional funny goof into a point of legitimate frustration. And if you'll permit me to be controversial here, I actually see their point, and in some ways agree with them. Early game in XCOM is where the RNG system is at its most goofy and random, because your soldiers have a wide margin for error, even with a clean shot, I want to say about 20-30%, to 30 and relying on them to do anything more than carry grenade, throw grenade, is like betting on a nap two hours before work. Even while flanking at point-blank range, your early soldiers have about a 15% f**k-up threshold. Only the shotgun and the pistol are immune to this rule innately, and I include the sword in that, but you need at least the Blade Master skill to make that hit reliably, otherwise it has an 88% chance to hit, and I already told you about XCOM's relationship with anything involving the number 80. And even with the shotgun and the pistol, that's only one primary weapon type out of the four you'll likely have in a single squad, and the pistol is a secondary weapon, only available to the sharpshooter that you need to properly build for in order to use most effectively. Although speaking of the sharpshooter, if there was ever one class that I had to choose that perfectly exemplifies how utterly nonsensical and random the early game of XCOM 2 can be, it's that one. Not to say they're bad, but they are probably the one class you'll be taking the most random why not shots with during those first few hours because of their innate ability squad sight. It's actually not entirely a bad idea to just park your early snipers on a high place and just ape the f out shooting at everything and everyone they can. They're gonna hit sometime. Although in my particular case, my sharpshooter just decided to be the bane of every point I wanted to make here because even when I was trying to miss with them, they wouldn't. Still, that just goes to show how unpredictably wacky XCOM's early game is. Or at least how it feels. And even late game, the RNG system can find ways to f with you. Consider this shot here. You have a 94% chance to hit. That means that out of 100 shots taken, 94 of them are likely to hit. But you're only taking one. Pardon me if I butcher multiverse theory a bit, but consider the possibility that there are 100 different parallel universes out there, one for each shot you took in that instance. And you just happen to be the unlucky son of a bitch in one of the six universes where you miss. That... that sucks. 
Now, yes, there are plenty of ways to wrangle the RNG in your favor in the early game, but that only influences it so much. What drives people away from XCOM is how prevalent that early game f**k-up feels. And yes, XCOM Reddit warriors, I see you with your multi-paragraph thesis on why I'm wrong, and you're not incorrect either. In fact, that leads perfectly into my next point. I said I understand, and in some ways agree, with the descent towards XCOM's RNG, but I never said that it was entirely correct. You can, and I use this term unironically, get good at XCOM, and the better you get and the further you get, the more manageable and predictable the game starts to feel. And then it starts to get too predictable, to the point where the RNG system actually falls off the other end of the extreme spectrum and becomes damn near vestigial. This is the other half of the difficulty debate when it comes to the modern XCOM games. The late game gets way too easy. This was already the case in vanilla XCOM 2, but all the additional content that was added to the game just made the problem worse. Especially in War of the Chosen. Oh boy, if you get your hands on one of the Chosen weapons, any of them, you basically win. And if you manage to get the Chosen sniper rifle and pistol early on like I did, you win even harder. Then add in tier 3 armor, blaster bombs, shred storm cannons, spark units, psionic units, max level class abilities, and everything else, and you get one hell of a toothless endgame. By the end, I didn't even bother with psionic units or leveling up all the expansion exclusive hero classes beyond my reaper. Why would I? I didn't need to. It certainly didn't feel like I was a scrappy resistance unit battling a world conquering superpower anymore. You get so f off powerful by the end of the game that you can make your biggest mistakes look like you meant to do them. For example, during this chosen stronghold mission, I had my reaper here do a bit of scouting. But, like a complete numbnut, I moved the rest of my squad up, all of whom were out of concealment by this point, before I checked this door to the next room. Sure enough, I go to open it, there's a bunch of enemies on the other side, and they immediately spot my other guys. Stop right there, criminal scum! They scamper, bump right into my Reaper, spot him, and suddenly I have a guy way out of position with only one action point left. Oh no. I should have been screwed, or at the very least should have taken some serious damage. But with that last action, I had my Reaper lay down an upgraded Claymore, triggered it with my Grenadier's Grenade, and nearly wiped three enemies out of existence with a double explosion. Yes, obviously I meant to do that, because I knew what position the enemies that I couldn't see would run into when I opened the door. Clearly, I am the biggest brain. Now, okay, there's a case to be made that that was just dumb luck with the enemies setting themselves up to be brain blasted so thoroughly. It wasn't just me being so powerful that the rules no longer applied to me. So let's see another example. Here, I was in an Avenger defense mission, and yet again, I had set my Reaper far ahead of everyone else. I'm noticing a pattern here. For the uninitiated, an Avenger defense mission is when your flying base, the Avenger, gets shot down, and you have to destroy this electromagnetic needle thingy that's keeping it grounded. So, I had my Reaper sneak forward, and through some clever shenanigans involving another upgraded Claymore and a conveniently placed gas tank, destroyed the objective before I even engaged most of the enemy forces. But, uh-oh, one of the enemy groups sprinted forward after getting damaged and ran straight into my Reaper, revealing him and activating every other pod of enemies on the map. Now he was way out of position, out of actions entirely, and couldn't even move because he was literally surrounded. Help! Okay, now he's dead, right? I mean, how in the fresh hell do you rescue anyone from that? Well, I decided to try. I grappled my sharpshooter onto a nearby rooftop, had my Grenadier and Spark both use their explosives to weaken as many enemies as they could, and then began firing on everything and anything in kill range. At this point, my sharpshooter had Serial, an ability that refunds his entire turn if he kills an enemy with a sniper rifle shot, as well as several damaging pistol shots that were either free to use or only costed a single action. The chosen sniper rifle also comes with three free reloads that don't cost any action points, which freed him up to continue his headshot rampage. By the end, he almost single-handedly cleared the entire field, and I got my group out without a single casualty. To me, that just ends the debate. In both of the above instances, I played like an absolute idiot, made huge mistakes that should have been fatal, and still got away unharmed. Now, you could say, well, Seth, you were just utilizing the resources available to you to fix those bad situations, and you're right. The point I'm making is that those resources were too damn powerful. Oh, sure, it was awesome, don't get me wrong, pulling off stuff like that feels great, but that quickly became my go-to method for dealing with just about everything in the endgame, and every mission started feeling the same. 
bomb a group of enemies to hell, then pick off the stragglers with my ranger and sharpshooter. Rinse and repeat ad infinitum. It wasn't just in this campaign either, this has been the end point for just about every campaign in my nearly 2,000 hours of playing XCOM 2. This kills that sense of tension and suspense from the earlier portions of the game, and as I said, it renders the RNG system almost meaningless. Not just because it's easier to hit your shots with all your soldiers maxed out, but because you have so many ways to force the system into your favor, and utter demolish the action economy, either by nearly leveling entire buildings with your metric ass load of explosives or by just throwing your supremely OP ranger at every problem until the problem is sliced into thinly cut ribbons. It doesn't just wreck the tension of the gameplay either, it hurts the game's narrative too. We are not the heroic underdogs when we're all loaded out like f***ing space marines. The only way the game responds to your increasing power is by throwing more enemies at you with progressively more and more health and armor. Toward the end, it isn't uncommon to come across multiple boss-level units in a single mission. So, on top of every encounter being resolved in basically the same way, they start taking forever because you have so much collective enemy health to chew through per mission. I legit just started ignoring missions, just so I could get to the final one faster. Of course, I'm biased since I've played this game for so long, but I know for a fact that this issue of late game power creep has been a point of contention among most modern XCOM fans, even back in Enemy Unknown. And I'd talk more about how the other two expansion classes, the Templar and the Skirmisher, break the game in their own unique ways, but we'd be here all day. Besides, I think you get the point. That all said, the final mission is actually pretty good. Unlike most of the game, this mission is a gauntlet that's a lot longer than what you're used to, and some of your most powerful items and abilities have limited usage, so you have to use them smartly if you want to make them last. However, the game makes up for this by giving you a super powerful avatar unit with some upgraded psionic abilities, like a massive AoE blast attack, a beam that hits everything in a line, and a mind control that only has a cooldown. It even works on gatekeepers, and let me tell you, a gatekeeper versus gatekeeper battle is a lot more underwhelming than you'd think. But all of that pales in comparison to the Avatar's most powerful trait, its ability to hit 75% shots reliably. Dear God. Okay, getting back on track. XCOM 2's early game and end game are two opposite extremes of the same problem. The early game can feel frustratingly random because you have too few options per soldier and you have such a wide margin for error, while the end game feels unsatisfyingly predictable and becomes far too easy to manipulate in your favor. So what's the solution here? What can we do in future XCOM games to fix this? Hi, how are you doing? Well, for the early game, if you don't want to meddle with the RNG system too much, there's a very simple addition that I think would balance things out nicely, the Subdue mechanic from Chimera Squad. Of all the new ideas presented in that game, that one was my favorite. A low damage, guaranteed hit melee attack that served as both an extra bit of mobility, as well as an easy way to finish off low health targets. As I said, one of the biggest frustrations with the early game is the lack of options and the general unreliability of your soldiers and this seems like a good way of fixing both problems at once. Plus, the sound effect on this thing is just satisfying as hell. I love it. As for the end game, well, I know no one is going to want to hear me say this, but I think the best way to address it is to nerf late game XCOM. I know, I know, it sucks to be nerfed, but taking away some of that late game power would make designing things to be challenging and not just take forever much easier. I do this not by making shots harder to land, but by taking away some of those late game abilities and items that break the game the most, or at least limit them a bit more strongly. I couldn't give you any specific examples beyond just limiting explosives a bit more, I'll leave that one to the actual developers to figure out. I'm not a game designer, and I don't claim to be, but this makes the most sense to me from a game player's perspective. The more abilities you have, the harder things get to balance, so taking away some of that late game power and adding it onto our early game could fix a lot of my personal issues. So to sum up this massive segment of the video, nerf our late game, buff our early game. <sighs> wow, I just spent about 10 minutes on this one part and I could have just said that, Jesus. Well, either way, big one is out of the way, now we get to move on to the more fun stuff. WAIT! We aren't quite done yet, because on the subject of things that need fixing, XCOM 2 is a bit of a messy game. 
Now, I'm not just talking about bugs or glitches. It has those, for sure it does, but I've not experienced many of the worst ones myself. I've had a couple of crashes and the odd softlock every now and again, but most of the bugs I've gotten have been visual ones. Pretty funny ones, I'll admit, like bodies being frozen mid-animation after being blown up. That's always good for a chuckle. No, what I'm talking about is XCOM's lacking optimization, both graphically and just in general. The game feels sluggish. Now, it probably didn't look like that from all the footage you saw earlier. In fact, a lot of the animations might have looked really snappy and responsive, right? Well, that's not how the game runs as standard. I've been using a mod called Stop Wasting My Time, made by Blue Roger, and it speeds up several animations in the game to make it run a lot smoother. Without the mod, a lot of the game slows to a crawl in spots, most notably on Overwatch shots. The game slows down time considerably, and the camera pans over to each unit as they take their shot. Individually. Hi, uh, doing a quick post-edit edit here. Pardon my voice, I'm recording this late at night. I'm actually partially wrong here. Stop wasting your time, my time, pardon me, does not speed up animations. What it does is remove some weird delays before and after certain actions. What's speeding up the game's animations in the footage is XCOM's own integrated zip mode, which is really fun to say. Zip mode. I just forgot to mention that. However, I am correct on stop wasting my time speeding up Overwatch shots. Just had to clarify that. Okay, back to the video. I don't remember this being quite as much of a thing in Enemy Unknown, was it? Am I remembering that wrong? I would have gone back to get footage of it, but at the time of recording, it's already taken long enough to get this video done, and I really don't want to spend more time sorting through clips. So feel free to tell me if Enemy Unknown got this sluggish feeling or not, because I really don't feel like it did. Beyond the oddly slow animations, there are also occasional weird hang-ups and what seems like lag between movements. Especially if you run across a civilian, because the game literally stops to watch them move away. Yeah, take your time. Speaking of wait times, these loading screens. <clears throat> Riveting. Okay, in all fairness, that one's probably on me, because I run with a lot of cosmetic mods. What isn't on me, however, is the lag on Lost Missions. See, when you kill an enemy in XCOM 2, its body doesn't disappear. It stays there for good until the mission's over. Now normally, I like this, because it's a nice way to look back and see your handiwork. And sometimes trampling over the corpses of your defeated assailants results in some hilarious ragdoll physics. But on Lost Missions, the body count can get so ridiculously high that it actually starts affecting the game's performance. I don't run into this problem much these days since I have a much better computer than I used to, but when I first started streaming this game, I'd be dropping frames and skipping left and right because the game was chugging along with so many bodies on screen at once. I can't imagine how someone with a more budget line PC would feel when playing these parts. Okay, 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 we'll move on to the fun stuff soon, I promise, but I want to highlight one more specific bug that has become rather infamous in the XCOM 2 community, and many of you probably already know what it is. Dear viewers, prepare yourselves, for what you're about to see next is not for the faint of heart. This beautiful specimen, known to the XCOM community as the squid, or the menu creature, is basically an SCP or a creepypasta come to life. It's a graphical bug that only appears on the main menu. See, what's supposed to happen is when you boot up XCOM 2 after you get your eardrums blown out, a little scene is supposed to play out with one of your characters in hiding. But every so often, the model glitches out and the menu creature makes itself known. It doesn't do anything, it just floats there, disturbingly convulsing and twisting like it's trying to play the animation data meant for the functioning model. This thing is so bizarre that a mod exists specifically to stop it from appearing, and even that doesn't remove it completely. It's a complete anomaly born from the coding of the game, and honestly, I'm fascinated. I'm hoping that in the future, the series gets these sluggishness issues fixed. The bugs are their own thing, and as shown by the magnificent menu creature, you can't always fix every single one. But the pacing issues are something that can absolutely be addressed completely in future games. Speedier animations and overall just minimizing the amount of time you're forced to stop and wait throughout your playthrough. Especially if you've played it several times already. Yes, I'm biased. Okay, I promised the fun stuff. 
Now we're moving on to the fun stuff. We've gone over my biggest issues, now let's go over my biggest hopes. There are quite a few things I'd like to see in future XCOM games, so let's collectively practice some wishful thinking, shall we? You know what I would love? Co-op XCOM. We have multiplayer PvP right now, but I have literally no desire to play it, have no footage of it, and from what I've heard, it isn't terribly well balanced. No, what I want is a co-op version of the main campaign, or perhaps a second campaign entirely designed around it. Even better if we can fit more than two players into it. What I envision is a playthrough where each participant has their own base set up on a different part of the world. And you can do things like trade resources between each other, loan out your soldiers to one another if your buddy loses one of their best and you have someone you can spare, enter missions together, or send in backup if your friend gets into trouble while you each control separate teams during missions. It'd be awesome! I mean, one of the core themes of XCOM is teamwork after all, right? You know, humanity banding together, throwing aside their differences to protect their homes and each other from some greater extraterrestrial threats. So this system would fit perfectly thematically. I want to show the giant flying spaghetti space monster the power of friendship with a good old fashioned coordinated tactical curb stomp. Now, as much as I would like to see something like this be in the next game, I highly doubt it will be, which is why I'm mentioning it first. Something this ambitious is probably going to require something like an expansion or a whole other game to make it happen. But hey, this is the fun part of the video now. This is where we find the biggest star to wish upon with all our hearts and maybe if we're all really good, it may just happen. So with that in mind, how about some more Chosen-esque enemies? To me, the strength of the Chosen wasn't their in-game boss fights, cause really, after a while, they stopped being an active threat. Except for the Warlock. He becomes a joke the second you get mind shields, and picking on him never stops being funny. No, for me, the strength of the Chosen is what they brought to Advent from a storytelling perspective. Personality. Now, I get it, Advent isn't supposed to be personable. In fact, visually, I think Advent's trooper units have a brilliant design. They look like they're small pieces of a massive army because, well, that's what they are. They aren't unique like the other aliens, they're purely manufactured, mass-produced soldiers, only made to look unique enough from each other so that you can tell the different types apart while still retaining a uniform look. It works well, but that doesn't make them any less boring. Before The Chosen, the only characters we had from Advent were the Speaker and the Elders themselves, neither of which got much screen time on the whole. So when the three purple-eyed edgelords made the scene, it felt refreshing to me, since now we had recurring familiar threats to deal with that liked to constantly remind us how much we sucked. Too much of the Elders' time has been wasted already. Their plan slowed by your clumsy interference. Okay, maybe they shouldn't have talked that much. Now, true, in Enemy Unknown, we didn't have any reoccurring baddies either, except for Exalt and Enemy Within, but the aliens we got overall had more charm in their cheesy, woo, spooky aesthetic and had more opportunities to show some personality. The biggest examples I can think of are the interrogation scenes of the Thin Man and the Ethereal. With the Thin Man, unlike most live interrogations where the aliens reacted with panic or hostility, they stand perfectly still, calm and collected in the center of the platform, just glaring at the machine with contempt. No panic, no rage, just pure irritation. They slowly walk toward the glass encasing them and just stare out at the staff in silence as the capsule shuts tight around them. From the body movements to the facial expressions, the Thin Man had a lot of character built into those few seconds of animation. The Ethereal, on the other hand, starts out calm and cool, poised in an elegant and righteous manner, as if it believes it's simply above all of this. But the second the machine activates, the facade crumbles as they recoil, clearly in pain, and try to fight back against it to no avail. I like this one in particular because it tells us the true nature of the Ethereals in only a few seconds. They believe themselves superior, higher beings that understand far more than we do, but are not quite as much as they think they are underneath it all, and are completely caught off guard by humanity's ingenuity, which is a pretty nice parallel to the overall plot. Now yes, the Chosen were all pretty much just different flavors of edgy, but they had some uniqueness beyond that. The Assassin is probably the most deserving of a Linkin Park soundtrack following her wherever she goes, but she has a strong sense of honor and dignity in being a warrior, and in the end commends XCOM's superior strength and wishes them victory in her final moments. I liked her death scene the most. 
The warlock harkens back to the ethereals in that he presents himself as superior and serving a higher cause, but progressively gets more petulant the more you piss him off. And as was said, he is utterly powerless against an item you can get within the first few hours of the game. And last but not least... Top of the morning to ya. What? How's it going, bros? My name's PewDiePie. Oh, it's just Walmart Markiplier. What a disappointment. <sighs> yes, The Hunter. Of all the chosen, I think The Hunter is the clear fan favorite, and mine as well. He's just so goddamn sassy and smug. I swear, it must be a universal law that every character voiced by Nolan North has to be a smartass, and The Hunter is no exception. What gave it away? The swirling mass of energy. Oh, you are a sharp one, aren't you, Doctor? I could keep doing this forever. Literally. What's your excuse? Don't you have a world to save? If it's purple, it must be psionic. Not that it matters. What you missed. So, what's the plan today? Storm the fortress, face the god like a mortal on his home turf, break for lunch. Sounds like fun. Like most of the Chosen, the Hunter stops being much of a threat after a certain point in the game, but he's always fun to listen to, even when he's getting beaten into the ground. Are you so sure about that, Commander? I seem to recall royally handing you your own ass twice on stream. Oh wait, the good people here haven't seen that other time yet, but they haven't seen much of you for a while now, have they? Oh, watch out, everyone. He might take three months to animate that gun shooting. <laughs> Brother, get on my level. Triple X Noob Hunter signing out. Hey. Remember JETS, that system of upkeeping an airborne defense to shoot down UFOs to protect your satellites and set up salvage missions? The system that more closely linked the combat layer of XCOM to its geoscape layer in at least some way? Can we just have more of that? Now obviously most of XCOM's focus is on its turn-based combat, but a little more to do on the geoscape layer would be nice. It was basically just a 100% RNG system, but the JETS were still, at the end of the day, something. Something to manage outside of base building and combat. The better your jets, the quicker and more reliably you could take down the bigger UFOs, and it was important to do this because salvage missions were payday for you and your crew, and usually meant that by the end of it you were going to leave with at least one more toy ready to be made. In XCOM 2, we didn't have a system like that at all at first. We only got one similar to it in the form of the Resistance Ring and more of the Chosen. So the already existing brick wall separating the combat layer from the geoscape layer got even bigger and brickier. That said, in the specific case of XCOM 2, I understand why they don't have the jet system. You're supposed to be a scattered resistance force that's barely holding its own against a tyrannical world-conquering power. Yes, we do have a giant flying fortress that completely throws all sense of that out the window, but also being able to command an entire air fleet would probably be pushing it just a little too much. Still, something to take its place would have been nice, and even then, the jets are just one example. I want to see more systems that link the combat and geoscape layers together. Something that gives you the ability to start missions on your own time. I don't like how a mission will spawn at almost the exact same time each in-game month. I'd like to be more involved in actually finding the missions first. And before anyone says anything, yes, Long War 2 had a system that's kind of close to what I'm talking about, but First of all, that was a mod, a very high profile one, but a mod nonetheless. And the missions that popped up for you to send a squad to infiltrate were random, which isn't what I'm looking for. I'm looking for the player getting more control over what missions spawn and when. Point is, the geoscape and base management layer are very disconnected from the combat layer. It'd be neat if the two layers could affect one another in more meaningful and unique ways, make the experience feel more connected and flow together better, you know? Now, I do have other things that I could list here in addition to what I've already said, but I need to get this video done, so we're gonna have to fast forward a bit. And most of this is probably not gonna happen anyway. I can wish all I want for a true co-op XCOM game, or heck, even just a really well-balanced experience, 
but there's no guarantee that we'll get anything that was mentioned in this video. Since a lot of what I mentioned requires either the story, the game, or both to be designed around them. And there's really only so much that you can fit into a single project. However, there is one thing that I'd love to see. One thing that I'm sure can and really should be done, because unlike everything else, it doesn't require entire systems designed around it. It's a simple addition, but it would be so damn cool to see more of this. And that is... More Tactical Legacy Pack music, please, dear God! Let me tell you something, when the Tactical Legacy Pack was announced and everyone was talking about the new content, I was over here thinking, nah, nah, give me that sweet new soundtrack, and I was not disappointed. For those wondering, when the Tactical Legacy Pack dropped for XCOM 2, it came with a brand new soundtrack full of modern recreations of music from the first XCOM game. And I don't mean Enemy Unknown, no, I'm talking UFO Defense, the very first XCOM game from 1993. I am extremely biased in favor of soundtracks that feature heavy synth and rock elements with plenty of that late 80s and early 90s kind of over-the-top awesomeness, and my god, does this soundtrack have that in spades. But what's great is that it isn't just all that high-energy action-y music, it runs the gambit. For instance, the main menu theme is very foreboding and mysterious, but gradually builds into something bigger, like it's the beginning of some grand adventure. The Geoscape music is very calm and reflective and gives the sense of taking a sigh of relief after a long, stressful mission. You've also got music that's more atmospheric, uneasy, and suspenseful, painting the image of your soldiers slowly advancing, sneaking through a battlefield, looking for the unseen alien threat. Then there's this one that feels a lot more unsettling and honestly kind of creepy. And then when it's time to blow shit up, you got stuff like this. No, 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 no. Seriously, listen to this. There's actually a lot of really good action tracks here. And then to cap it all off, we've got what is hands down my absolute favorite victory theme in history.
complete with sick guitar solo. This music may not be for everyone, but good lord is it for me. In an era where so many major games have bland or forgetful music to appeal to the lowest common denominator possible, it's stuff like this that I yearn for, music with an identity that in turn helps give the game it's a part of an identity. And this is the kind of game I want to play, where we take the fight to the stars in an over-the-top battle against whatever horrid eldritch nightmare awaits us with this kind of music backing it. XCOM as a series is important to me. I know I'm still a newbie despite all my time spent with the recent games as I've never played the originals, but even still, this series has me hooked. I may be bored to tears of XCOM 2 by this point after nearly 2,000 hours, but I only stuck with the series for this long because it does something that no other game does for me right now. And it still has a lot of untapped potential that I hope gets fully realized in future games. And I will absolutely follow it wherever it goes from here. So that's all for now, folks. Hope you enjoyed the video, and I hope it was worth the wait. And maybe, just maybe, I'll see you in the next one. If you have any suggestions and wishes of your own for the future of the series, then feel free to leave it in a comment below. So, once again, y'all have a lovely evening, and I'll see you next time.